hey, good morning, Evergreen Church. How are we doing this morning? I see people are still settling in in the back, which is great. Well, my name is Austin Blashinsky. I am the pastoral intern here, and it is great to have you with us, whether you are here in person or virtual. Uh, it is such a gift to gather weekly uh, together to be the church together. I have a few announcements for us this morning, and so uh, we've got some important ones here, so it's important that we pay attention uh, to our announcements. Maybe there might be a quiz afterwards. Uh, the first one is that after the, after the contemporary service at 12.15 today, we are going to have a guest services meeting. So if you are, uh, have been part of guest services team or are interested in finding more, I'd love for you to join us. Uh, we will have lunch provided for you. So, you know, after this service, go run some errands and then come on back uh, and we will meet in this room uh, to begin our guest services meeting at 12.15 p.m. Also, we want to thank you for all of your hard work in getting those hoodies in for I-58. We know that there are a lot of children who have been blessed by the personalization of these hoodies that you guys have taken care of. And so uh, today is technically the deadline to turn those in. So if you have not turned your hoodie in that you have sponsored, uh, please get on that and bring that in uh, sometime this week or let Hannah know if you need uh, some help with that. And speaking of your great participation with the hoodies, I have one more challenge for you this morning regarding helping children get back to school on a good foot. Uh, and so if you aren't familiar, we've been running a summer lunch program this summer. And the last week of the summer lunch program, we like to hand out backpacks filled with school supplies for the children so that they have exactly what they might need uh, to you know, get off on a good start for the school year. And so I have a challenge. And are you guys ready for a challenge? Yes. All right. You've got one week. So next Sunday, you see this backpack I have on with me. Would you consider bringing in a backpack to donate? We need 50 backpacks in total. And we've got a one-week deadline. So I know that's kind of a time crunch. But I think, you know, in getting to know this congregation, you guys are ready for that challenge. So come on next Sunday and bring a backpack. You could also drop it off during the week. Uh, but we need 50 uh, students to sponsor with backpacks. So if you'd consider dropping off a backpack to church next Sunday or any school supplies that you might pick up, that would be greatly appreciated. And the last announcement that we have for you this morning is that we are doing a parents' afternoon out on July 24th, and that's going to be from 12 to 4 p.m. So if you want to go as a parent or even a grandparent, run some errands uh, and do that, we will have... Uh, volunteers here to have field day games, Bible trivia, arts, crafts, etc. And if you are planning on taking advantage of that, will you register on F1 Go for this parents' afternoon out? So those are the announcements that I have for you all this morning, and let's prepare our hearts for worship. Good morning, Evergreen. Great is our Lord, whom we have come to worship this Sunday morning. As we have gathered, uh, all of us bringing in something different from the week uh, before us, whether it be our joys, our pains, our hopes, our questions, uh, would we lay them at the foot of the cross as we remember what Christ has done for us and seek how to know him more? Join me in prayer this morning. Father, days you have touched our lives. All good things are a gift from you intended to draw our attention in worship and praise to you. Help us continue to catch glimpses of your glory, which allow us to trust you in both the mountains and in the valleys. As we gather this morning to worship you, we know that there is nowhere we could hide from you. You know the very depths of our hearts. Instead of running from you, would you continue to teach us how to trust in you, knowing that you love us and have deemed us blessed? Prepare our hearts for worship and soften our hearts so that we may obey your voice however we are called by you. 
In the name of Jesus Christ, we trust and pray. Amen. Let us continue to prepare our hearts and minds this morning for worship as we listen to the prelude. Call to worship is a reminder for us to remember why we have gathered, with whom we have come together, and to whom we direct our praise. I will begin this morning's call of worship based on Psalm 133 with the following words on the screen. Behold, how good and pleasant it is to dwell together in unity. It is a gift from the Lord. We gather this morning as witness to the blessings of God, which are abundant, and give him thanks. Amen. If we can't get them up on the screen, Don's going to come and do it as a solo. <laughs> so. Ah, the Lord's watching after Don. Okay. Here we go. Let's try this again. Introduction, go.
Please be seated. Our prayer of confession is not just a weekly time for us to press the reset button on our sin or clear out our own conscience, but it serves as a greater purpose of intentionality, turning from the things that separate us from God and receiving his love and grace as we do so. Holy God, you have searched the depths of our hearts and know what lies beneath. In so many ways, we have strayed from you in both action and inaction. Yet your word teaches us that there is freedom in confession. As the psalmist writes, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Continue to teach us the importance of confession to you. Knowing we have. I'll begin. God. Thanks be to God. Amen. coming up, if you would at least wave at the people who are across from you, welcome each other to worship this morning. Good morning. So I want to tell you a little story about one of my grandchildren. We were having a family gathering, and my father was there, Grandpa Bob, he's back there, he's and he has a little dog, and the dog's name is Sammy. And one of, I could see Sammy needed to go out, you know how animals need to go out. So I said to my grandson, would you take Sammy for a walk? And I handed him one of these. You know what that's for? And my grandson sort of rolled his eyes, but he took Sammy for a walk. And when he came back, he handed me the bag back, and it had something in it. So... I tied it up and threw it in the garbage and washed my hands. And you know th what I said to him? I said, I'm so proud of you. You did that without complaining. And do you know what he said to me? He said, well, Oma, I wasn't complaining on the outside, but I was complaining on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> Are we like that, right? Sometimes we know what we're supposed to do but we don't really want to do it. And we do it on the outside, but our hearts aren't really in it. I bet sometimes you have that, like maybe your mom or dad says, apologize to your sister. You say, I'm sorry. Ever done that? 
right? So you're, you're doing it on the outside, but not on the inside. And we've been talking about the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus is teaching the people about this sort of this difference between obeying God on the inside and obeying him on the outside. And God is happy when we obey him on the outside, but he really cares about us learning to obey him on the inside. And um, th there's really good news about that. Jesus came to free us from the problems that are on the inside. And in fact, even in the Old Testament, the prophet even then told the people, uh, here's the good news. I'm going to give them, that means his people, an undivided heart. And I'm going to put a new spirit in them, and I'm going to take away their hearts of stone and give them a heart of flesh. And that's really good news. We can do a lot about obeying God on the outside, but only God can actually change our hearts so that the inside and the outside match. Remember, I told you we're, ho we're Easter people, and after Easter, Jesus, after Jesus rose from the dead, the Holy Spirit came to live in us. And it's the Holy Spirit that gives us a new heart on the inside. When we walk close with God and we try and stick really, really close with Jesus and pray, over time, our hearts start to become more like his. And that's really good news. Okay? So let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that you don't leave us stuck with our hearts of stone. Thank you that you want to change us so that our hearts on the inside match the obedience we sometimes do on the outside. Help us to stick close to you so that we can have that new heart you promised. In Jesus' name, amen. We want our children to go to their Sunday school now, is that correct? I think most of us at, at one time or another have heard the name George Beverly Shea, the great singer for Billy Graham Crusades for many, many, many years. And the song that Bob and I would like to <coughs> sing for you this morning is a song that Bev Shea did many, many, many times at the uh, Billy Graham Crusades. And uh, every now and then he would do a duet with Cliff Barrows and uh, this particular song. But every time George Beverly Shea sang this song he told this story Bev Shea had a wonderful friend by the name of Bert Grazin and he himself was a great singer but Bert was drafted during World War II went to the army and served there was one particular time and, and Bert relayed this story to Bev Shea when he returned from the war there had been a fierce battle Bert's company was part of that battle and it came a time and the battle ended many many of his comrades his friends had been killed and Bert was wounded severely it was one of those times when the German soldiers were not taking prisoners and the German soldiers were going through the ranks of the wounded and making sure there were no none of their enemy left to live so Bert knew that his time was near. And there was a song that Bert's mother sang to him as a child. A song called Jesus Whispers Peace. And Bert lay there wounded, singing this song that his mother had sung to him for so many years as a child. And Bert closed his eyes and sang knowing that his end was near and when he came to the last verse he opened his eyes and there stood a German soldier with his bayonet drawn ready to end his life and the German soldier looked at him and said sing it again and Bert sang that song again German soldier turned, walked away, and allowed Bert to live. Jesus does whisper peace.
The great Beverly Shea. Yeah. Well, thank you for um, thank you for that story that went with the song. I think it makes all the difference in the world when when we know the the thought and the heart behind those things. Well, would you pray with me as we get started this morning? God, thank you for being in this place with us. Thank you that you accept our worship in whatever form we bring it, and that it brings pleasure to you. Lord, we are so grateful for your son, Jesus. And we pray this in his name, amen. So I wanna start this morning by saying, he is risen. risen See, you got it. If you're new with us, you might not have any idea what that's all about, but that is something that we generally say on Easter morning, and Pat reminded me once again that we are Easter people. And that means that Easter is every day. It's not just on Sunday. It's not just on Easter Sunday. It is every day of the week. And that is a very important thing. Well, I want to thank you for being here this morning. It's hard to believe, right? I was looking at the calendar. Is it hard for you to believe that the summer is almost coming to an end? I saw John put his head down because he's a teacher. And teachers in particular are like, it's coming to an end. Summer is my very favorite time of year. Um, I think it's the ease of summer that I like. I mean, I love the fall. I mean, once the weather cools off and, and all those kind of things, but I just kind of hate to see the ease of summer come to an end. A few weeks ago, we started a series called Going Deep, and it's a series based on the Sermon on the Mount, which you can find in Matthew uh, chapter 5 through 7. Much of what in the, in the Sermon on the Mount is pretty familiar material. If you've been around a church once or twice, you may have heard um, these things talked about before. Um, but you might not have ever heard all of it, and I'm not sure that you've ever heard it taken in order in context, which is what we are trying to do. And so what the reason we're doing that is because what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount is extremely important for followers, for people who are trying to imitate Christ, which is what Jesus calls us to do as disciples. We are literally being called to be imitators of Jesus. And in the Sermon on the Mount, what Jesus is doing is laying out ideas about how a disciple lives, specifically how a disciple lives in something called the kingdom of heaven. Now, I'm going to back up just a little bit and remind you of a 30,000-foot view here, and the reason I keep coming back to this 30,000-foot view is because much of what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, if you forget this view, it can be taken as moralizing. And while morals and values, whatever you want to call them, while they are good, if they're taken out of context, or worse, if we don't understand the point of the morals, the why Jesus is saying what he is saying, then what Jesus is saying can feel not only difficult, but condemning. It's certainly not life-giving. And when you consider Jesus' words, when if somebody says, well, they're condemning or they're not life-giving, then that doesn't line up with the story of God and the story of Israel. It doesn't line up with the truth of a very often repeated statement in the Bible that the steadfast love of the Lord never ends. And so, what is going on here? Well, to put it simply, to back up to the very beginning, way back in Genesis, you will remember that God created the world and he created it perfectly and that humanity broke that perfection through sin. Now, if you go back and you look, what you will notice is, is that that sin is actually a matter of the heart. Yes, 
there is also a reaching out. There is a grabbing. There is a taking. What is forbidden? But it all started in the heart of Adam and Eve when they doubted the goodness of God. Ever since that moment, God has been calling his creation back to him. He has been trying to put things back together again, restore the perfection of his creation, restore the perfect relationship that humanity had with him and that humanity had with, uh, with each other. The Old Testament is one long story of the grace of God. It is the people failing over and over again and God taking them back. There's always this promise that one day God would restore what was originally intended. And the language around this is something like the kingdom of heaven would once again become the reality that people live in. Now, Jesus is the fulfillment of that promise. We know that because of the cross. We know that because of the resurrection. We know that because of the coming of the Holy Spirit on people. But before we even get to that point in the story, we know Jesus is the fulfillment because he tells us. At the very start of Matthew, Jesus says that we should repent. Now, let me just say, repent. A lot of people think, well, that's a terribly negative word, is it? All it really is is a change of mind. That's what it means, change your mind. Jesus is saying you need to change your mind about the way the world works. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now, if you are sick or poor or lost or lonely or destitute or whatever it might be, if the world you know is not working for you but against you, when Jesus says there is a new kingdom, a new sheriff in town, so to speak, that is very good news. And this is why Jesus addresses the Sermon on the Mount to people who are broken and lost. And the people that he is preaching to are people who are not guessing whether they're broken and lost. They are obviously broken and lost. He has just finished healing a crowd of people, people with various illnesses, seizures, um, paralyzed, demon-possessed, people who are suffering from severe pain. Jesus has just healed them, and so this crowd that is around him is made up of people who are already understanding that the kingdom of heaven looks very different from the world that they used to live in. Jesus has healed them from physical brokenness, and now he wants them to understand how to live their lives into this new thing called the kingdom of heaven. I think to hear Jesus properly, we have to find our seat in that crowd. We have to own our own sense of brokenness and pain. Whether it's an illness of the body, illness of the spirit, illness of the mind, a sense of injustice, a thirst for righteousness. To hear Jesus we have to hear him from that space in order to really hear what he is saying as good news. We have to own the painful and the frustrating reality that's around us. I am absolutely convinced that if we only hear Jesus from a place of comfort, his words will miss us. They will go right over our heads or they will deeply offend us. So the whole point of what Jesus is doing here is describing what life in the kingdom of heaven looks like, what we can expect. And he does so by contrasting what people have been told and taught, what they believed, and the actual reality of the kingdom of heaven. He says, you have heard it said, but I say to you. Okay, here we go. We are in Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to begin in verse 27 and read down through verse 30. Listen to the word of the Lord. 
You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Really? Really? Thanks be to God. I know. But doesn't that make you squirm a little bit? Makes me squirm a little bit. It's intended to make you squirm a little bit. That's why Jesus said it. Remember, Jesus is setting up this bold contrast between what we accept as normal and what the kingdom of heaven looks like. And what we accept as normal is a world where it's okay to lust, where it's not okay to actually cross the line into the fulfillment of lust, but it's okay to be over here and lusting. And Jesus says, um, no. While adultery is not an acceptable action, let's step behind it, Jesus says, because the real problem isn't the action. The real problem is the heart which leads to the action, which is essentially the same thing that he said in the last passage about murder and anger, which Austin covered last week. Sure, don't murder, but the bigger problem is the angry heart which leads you to murder. You see, Jesus is very concerned about wrong behavior, but he's more concerned about a wrong heart. You can prohibit behavior all day long, but if the heart's wrong, it's just going to become this frustration and tension that never goes away. In the kingdom that Jesus preaches and proclaims and eventually opens the door to through the cross, that kingdom for Jesus is not about managing our sin and our bad behavior. It's about living out of a new heart. So we don't have to manage the behavior. Now, I know people don't love it when the preacher starts talking about sexual ethics. Anybody love that? I don't. And honestly, people don't love when Jesus talks about them either. And truthfully, if you go back to John the Baptist, he literally lost his head because he spoke sexual ethics to the king. But remember, Jesus is dealing with real life. Jesus meets people where they are. Sex is a part of life. Denying that is just silly. But Jesus knows, because he has seen it, lust is a kingdom killer. When you think about how God would have had the world work, what was originally intended before sin, Jesus knows lusting, which is, which is desiring someone in such a way that it objectifies the person right? It's not really about who the person is. It's just it, it, they turn into an object. The, the target of lust is, is just this thing, and lust ignores all the relationships, the relationships that may be around this person who is the target of lust, or even the relationships of the person who is doing the lusting. What Jesus knows is that lust just rips people apart. It shatters love between neighbors, between friends, Lust can even impact an entire community. Now, let me be clear about something here. When Jesus is talking about lust, he is not saying he's against physical desire. That would actually make no sense because God created men and women to have physical desire for each other. One of God's earliest commandments to Adam and Eve is this, be fruitful and multiply. If you've ever read the Song of Songs in the Old Testament, you will understand that passion and attraction are not something that God is against. In fact, I would say that God invented those things. What Jesus is against is a disordered use 
of what God has given to us as a good gift. Now, there are many, many ways your heart can be disordered sexually, but here Jesus is specifically talking about male lust towards a woman, his wife. He's talking about a desire so deep that it leads to fantasizing about the physical act itself. And Jesus teaches, unlike those who came before him, right? You've heard it said, but I tell you, unlike those who have come before him, Jesus says that once you get to that spot, even though it's just in your mind, you have crossed the line. The kingdom of heaven is not a place where we can walk up to the line and say, oh, well, I'm doing all this over here, but so long as I don't reach over here, I am righteous. Who wants that? That sounds exhausting. See, the place where people come off the rails with this passage is where Jesus starts talking about cutting off your hand and gouging out your eyes, right? I mean, we could talk about those things in detail. For example, the the right eye, which is what Jesus talks about, seems to be thought of biblically as the dominant eye, and there is a dishonor and a lack of status that, that comes with losing your right dominant eye, which means that Jesus is saying it is better for you to walk through life dishonored and with a low status than it is for you to live a lifestyle of lust which is going to lead you into destruction. Now, I have known people over the years who have lived a lifestyle of lust. And let me tell you, and they would tell you as well, lust will lead you to live in hell. There's no question about it. More accurately, the word translated hell here is a place outside of the city of Jerusalem called Gehenna. It is a valley best known for child sacrifices and other heinous things. See, what Jesus is trying to get across here is that there is nothing good that is going to come from this. And if you have ever walked through this with someone, whether they're in your family, somebody you worked with, somebody who has struggled through this or had it done to them, whatever it might be, you know that lust leaves a wake of suffering behind it. And the sad thing to me is this, and you might remember this from a series that we went through not too long ago where we were talking about the difference between believing in Jesus and actually believing Jesus, right? I mean, here we tend to think when it comes to lust, oh, it's no big deal. No big deal. Not at all. No harm, no foul, no big deal. But Jesus says no. And I have to say that I resonate with the comments from someone like Dallas Willard who says, look, Over and over and over again in the Sermon on the Mount, what Jesus is saying is this, do what I say. In fact, at the very end, he says, if you don't do what I say, you're like a foolish man who builds his house on sand that can't withstand the storms that come against it. And Dallas Willard says, look around, look globally, and you will see what 2,000 years of listening to the words of Jesus and then not doing them looks like. We are reaping what we have sown. And I mean, look, I know that when Jesus says these words in Matthew, they're directed towards men. They are. But there is no way, especially in our culture, that these words don't apply to women too. And look, man or woman, the truth is we live in a culture that is absolutely steeped in lust. Lust is encouraged It is considered healthy. In fact, I would argue that we are not only encouraged and taught to lust, that we are also taught and encouraged to be the object of lust. That's also a goal and a good. And we teach this to our children, to our girls, with harrowing and awful consequences. And make no mistake, we teach it to our boys, too. And the consequences aren't any better. 
a number of years ago, for some reason, I was in New York City um, like two days after Christmas. This is when we lived up there. And I used to go into the city sometimes to have lunch with people or to go study in one of the libraries. And whatever reason, I was in New York a couple of days after Christmas and I was walking by Macy's Herald Square. And for some reason, I decided it was a great idea to go in Macy's two days after Christmas to see what they had on sale. I literally got lost in the store. If you've ever been in there, it's gigantic. And I couldn't figure out how to get out. And so I was kind of like actually following a wall because I figured, well, if this is the wall, it's sooner or later it's going to lead me to a door. Well, it ended up in the fragrance cosmetics area. And I'm standing there and I'm kind of walking through and it's, you know, it's a high space. And there are these displays that are probably two or three stories high of half-naked women and half-naked men selling me beauty. And I thought, Lord, I walked into Macy's and somehow I've arrived in Babylon. <laughs> and I know most of the time, to be honest with you, I'd have walked by those displays and not even noticed them. Which means that just like the people who were in the crowd that day that Jesus was preaching, I thought it was normal. I'd accepted it. It didn't need to be railed against. Except Jesus says that it does. Because it leads to destruction. I'm not trying to judge anybody else. I'm not. I don't, I don't actually think, and please, you know, don't go hold a protest at Macy's or something. I mean, please don't, because I don't think that helps. I really don't. I think it's about guarding your own heart and mind. It's about safeguarding your own spirit. Jesus does not prohibit lust in order to be a killjoy. He prohibits lust because it's poisonous to our hearts. And whether that poison kills a relationship between a man and a woman because one of them thinks things are better over there than they are here, or it tells a woman that she is only valuable because of how she looks, or it tells a man or a woman you are unworthy and incapable of the relationship that you want because you're not the object of lust. Whatever form the poison takes... The heart it produces left completely unchecked is a heart that is going to break community. It is a heart that is far from the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus says it is a heart that will lead you to hell. So, what to do? Well, first, I think that we need to understand that there is healthy, life-giving attraction, and we need to understand what that looks like. And then we need to begin to separate out, if we are students of lust, man or woman, we need to separate out what's healthy and what's not. And that might take some time, and it might take some work, but it can be done and certainly worth doing. Secondly, I would say do not linger around images or thoughts which lead you in the wrong direction. Now, if this is a thought process that you have been doing for a long time, I, listen, you're not going to leave here today, and that thought process is going to just pop, out, pop itself out of your life. It's just not. It's going to take work and time. You have to become a student of your own thought processes, your own heart, your own soul, so that you notice when these things become part of what is going on around you. Remember, this is a heart issue. So you have to be a student of your own heart. Third, if you find yourself in a lustful fantasy of some kind, once you find yourself in it, once you recognize that that's where you are, I would say step back and consider the object of your lust. He or she is a person with a family, friends, feelings, hopes, dreams, failures. They, just like you, are created in the image of God. Now, I know from speaking with people who have gone through transformation over the years in areas of sexual health that you cannot do this on your own. 
If you have tried to do this on your own and failed, you know this is true as well. So what I would tell you is find someone to walk through it with you. It can be a counselor. It can be one of the pastors. It can be a trusted friend. And I know that these kind of things bring up all kinds of shame and guilt, but shame and guilt are nothing but self-judgment. And God is trying to bring you into a new kingdom, into a new reality. And so God's not judging you. He wants you to come in this direction. He's opened the door for you to come into this new direction. And if you're walking with another person, the one thing I would tell you is, is that someone who actually knows their own sin, um, they're not going to judge you. They're going to walk with you and love you. Frankly, I think it's high time the church, not just this church, but the church, figured it out. How to walk with people who were walking through all kinds of things, whether it's anger or, or lust or we're going to be talking about divorce. I mean, we have to figure out how do we walk through this and live out the kingdom of heaven and become stronger and stronger in our ability to reflect that kingdom as a present reality right now. And the truth is, the better we become at doing that with the help of the Holy Spirit and with the companionship of other people around us, the more we do that, the more we testify to the truth of what Jesus says, that the kingdom of heaven has come near. And the more we testify to this truth, the more transformed we become. And the more transformed we become, the more beautiful the kingdom of heaven actually looks. And more people will begin to believe, you know what? In Christ, there is new life, a life lived out in a kingdom ruled by one who bled for the love of those who populate that kingdom. Would you pray with me? Lord, your words aren't always easy, and maybe that's good. Maybe it is. But we know we need your help because we can't do it on our own. We've, we've tried and failed, but, but Lord, I ask that you would so firmly fix in our minds a vision of the kingdom of heaven that you preached and proclaimed that though we fail, we would not give up. That we would continually work through the help of the Holy Spirit, through your grace in our lives, through other people who are around us, that we would continually make movement in that direction, even where we are weak, even where we are struggling. Lord, we know that as your people, we are called to live out this kingdom life wherever we are, Monday through Saturday. And then we come here, Lord, to give you all thanks and all praise. Lord, thank you for believing in us sometimes when we don't believe in ourselves. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Every worship service we have an, offer, uh, an opportunity to give, and the reason that we do that is because it acknowledges that all good gifts come from God. Now, we're still not passing offering baskets. Maybe in another week or two we will be doing that. But I just want to, um, to bring that to your attention, that part of worshiping is an offering. Paul actually says, offer yourselves as an acceptable offering to the Lord. So, would you pray with me around our offering? Lord, we do want to offer you but our very lives. And it is remarkable that you, that you call even us, use even us, believe that we are ambassadors of your kingdom. And so in big ways and small ways, Lord, would you accept our offerings? Would you see them as movement towards you in love? 
We give you all the glory, thanks, and honor. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together for the doxology. Affirmation of faith is based on Titus chapter 2. Would you join me? For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation, training us to live upright and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the God, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself to us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify himself, a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. Amen. probably no better hymn to end that with or that sermon, right? Because that's what we need, is a closer walk with Him. He has told us, I will not leave you nor forsake you, and He won't. He is with us through everything. And so, my friends, as you prepare to go out into the world, 
remember that you are an ambassador of the kingdom. How you live your life matters. What you say and how you say it, what you do and how you do it, because somebody is watching you wanting to know what does it mean to follow this risen Christ. And so go out and love your neighbors and serve the Lord. May the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and in you, both now and forever. Amen. If you would please be seated for the postlude.